Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and then 21 and 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn in unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. In a congregation I served a few years back, I remember a conversation with a man whom I would classify as an asthete. Anybody know what the term asthete means? It almost sounds like you're saying a dirty word, doesn't it? You're not. An asthete is a person who, by all accounts, is centered in the sensitivity and the appreciation of art in all forms. I have to admit, I miss the conversations that we have, for I am a closet lover of art myself. I love to go sit down at the DIA and sit in the various galleries and just look and let my mind water, and and I enjoy reading the history of various artists. I especially loved how he opened my eyes to a deeper understanding of the works in the life of Vincent van Gogh, Paul Gauguin, and especially one of my all-time favorites, George Seurat. Because this man had an understanding and a passion that always seemed to invite me into the beauty of not only his soul, but of the piece of art and the art that we were working with, talking about, looking at. It was always a great joy. Now, this man and his wife, from the conversation I'm recalling, had just returned from a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where they were searching for a new piece of art for the wall of the foyer of their new home. I did forget to mention, this man had a lifestyle that I can't come close to understanding, taking a special trip to an artisan town to look for art to put in their newly built home. Sorry, I, my world just doesn't go there. But he had. He and his wife had spent the week searching in and out of various shops, enjoying the local artisans, being enwrapped by the images that were put onto canvas, into pottery, into local beadwork. But when they entered one particular shop, the man was awestruck by the bronze scrapped, bronze, bronze sculpture that uh, you're going to see right now. This piece is entitled, The Dove, and it was created by the late artist Gib Singleton. He recently passed away a few years ago. Now, for those who have not heard of his work, Mr. Singleton uh, was a favorite artist of the Vatican. Uh, You'll find his works in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. He was also a favorite of Golda Meir, the former and late Prime Minister of Israel. When it came to restore the Piate, which is a marble sculpture by Michelangelo depicting Jesus laying across the lap of Mary right after his crucifixion, he was the sculptor there to offer the expertise to bring it back to its original glory. Now, this particular piece left my friend in his tracks. He was mesmerized mesmerized as he explained it to me. For when Singleton cast this piece, he had one goal in mind, to capture the moment when Jesus was being baptized, that moment when he came out of the water, capturing the moment when the dove descended and landing on his, landed on his outstretched hand and the voice of God spoke. Singleton sought to capture that moment in the life of our Savior. And I admit, when the picture is a little more clearer, The symbolism is quite 
powerful. Look at the arms of Jesus and how they are outstretched. It's a welcome to all, red or yellow, black or white. Jesus stands ready to embrace anyone who is willing to come to him. Secondly, as the arms are stretched out, it depicts the form of a perfectly shaped cross. Singleton's intent was to reveal to us that Jesus' baptism commissions to him the beginning of a new mission here on earth, which will culminate in the ultimate saving act that was performed on the cross. So Jesus is portrayed as both welcoming to all and ready to die for the sins of all in one image. This welcoming and sacrificial character of Jesus is also captured by Luke in our passage today. In that moment of Jesus' baptism, when the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, empowering him to face all that will come to pass in his ministry. What is captured here, both in the sculpture and the passage, is the mission in which Jesus has given himself to be baptized into, that not only welcomes us, you and I, but also saves us from the darkness of this world and within ourselves. Luke tells us that the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah they were waiting for. And then something happens. The people are close to mistaking the messenger for the message, but John the Baptist clears the air by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the laces of his sandals. This is an incredibly powerful statement that is lost on our culture. John the Baptist is popular enough to draw a crowd. He has the charisma to hold the people's attention. And at the same time, with all this ego boost that he could be getting of, wow, look at what I'm doing He admits, he humbles himself to the fact that he is not the main attraction, he is merely a helper. The focus of his missional integrity, that of John's, never weakens or never falters. He's always putting God first. For as John baptized with water, a life-giving element that allowed you to live another day on earth, The one who is more powerful will baptize with the Holy Spirit and holy fire. These are elements that only come from God and give us eternal life. Luke and Singleton, however, captures the point of John the Baptist as well when Jesus the Messiah will have an awesome power that will be enacted by the passing through the waters of baptism. This power will give Jesus the authority to judge honestly and the integrity of our hearts and minds. This is what John the Baptist means in Luke when he says, his winnowing fork is at hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat, the fruit, into his granary, but the chaff, that which has no value, will be burned in unquenchable fire. Luke tells us all the people were baptized And that Jesus was baptized also, washing away who they were before to emerge from the water as a new clean person God has called and created them to be. And it's as Jesus is praying, that's when the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. As if it isn't enough, the voice speaks from the heavens, you are my son, the beloved With you, I am well pleased. It is a moment of incredible power, for it is the first recorded place where you have the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit together in one brief scene. You don't see it again until the transfiguration. In this moment, When God speaks, he affirms three things about Jesus. Three things to Jesus, three things to John, three things to the crowd, three things to us. 
First, Jesus is the Son of God. No question. He claimed Him. Secondly, He is loved by God. No question. He said it. Thirdly, God is pleased with that which Jesus has done and that which Jesus will do. Whenever I read and meditate on this particular passage, it always makes me think of my own baptismal experience. Do you remember the day the water touched and cleansed your body? Do you remember how it felt when you came up feeling louder, empowered, embraced? For in the affirmations we see from God about his son, we too have the same affirmations when we go through the waters of baptism. We are God's children. We are loved by God. And God is pleased with us. And in the way that Jesus was empowered to embark on the mission God sent Jesus to fulfill, we too are called and enabled to follow Jesus and be a part of his mission as well. A mission that is to welcome all, serving all until we are called home in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Sorry. Luke records John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, a man without sin, no inappropriate thoughts, no misplaced anger, no selfish aggression, no swearing, no cheating, no lying, no manipulating others so they can win at all costs, no wanting to be the one who everyone looks up to and admires. He baptizes Jesus into a ministry of service and personal sacrifice. I think... In that sculpture, Singleton captures the baptism as a moment of empowerment and affirmation by God. We recently had the funeral for Tim Schlenkert. And while I am thankful at how Pastor James was willing to fulfill the family's request to have him officiate, It did not stop the chills going up and down my spine every time I approach a service for a brother and sister in Christ. There is always some form of affirmation that this child of God was baptized and clothed in the glory of Jesus Christ. We do this at a time of remembrance, a time of celebrating life. Because baptism represents the beginning of a journey of sacrificial service that reaches its completion when we enter the gates of heaven. Until we are called home to be with God, there are always ways in which we can serve. It may be different from how you personally served 20 years ago. It may be different from how you served a year ago. But serving in the name of Jesus fulfills the mission that we have all been baptized into. Because like Jesus, we are to live out our baptism every day in feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the dying, and sharing the good news with all of the broken in this world. As people who bear the name Christian, we, God calls us to live out our baptism the same way Jesus did. We too are called, filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered and enabled to embark in a ministry of welcoming and redeeming sinners, people who are just like us and different from us all at the same time. In the last congregation that I served before I came here, um, there was an older gentleman. When I mean older, I mean older than me. He had grandchildren. And he was asking to be baptized. Now, this man attended church and Bible study regularly. He was a loving man who was still just as enamored with his wife as the first day he went on their first date. He adored his children, and he could not help but drink up and live off the presence of his grandchildren. But he came to me one day after worship saying, Church isn't the same for me anymore. I've tried more prayer. 
I've tried more study. I've tried more service, but I realized that I needed to start over again, rededicate my life to Jesus. So I've done that. Would you rebaptize me? I looked at him and I saw the honesty in his eyes. And I said, Of course I will. And we set a date. Now, his grandchildren, the oldest being about 10 or 11, had a whole bunch of questions about what their grandpa was doing, and the grandfather would send the children and come and talk with me. For a number of weeks, I had his grandkids waiting outside my office door, wanting to ask me questions. We crawled around the baptistry to kind of show them what it looked like and show them what the actions would look like once the, once the pool was filled with water. They thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and on the day of the baptism, they were even in the wings in the, the baptistry watching their granddad go under the water, just mesmerized and drinking it up. I took the grandfather down. I brought him back up. And probably about five or six, they said, uh, that was cool. Do it again. Now, I'm holding the grandfather in my arms as he's having the water shed off of his eyes. And when he opened them up, he looked at me with, and he finally said, would you? And I said, I'm game if you are. And he went, okie dokie, so down again and back out. A member of the congregation who was older than this grandfather after church during the fellowship hour found this child and began to scold them for making a mockery of the baptism during the service. I started walking towards them to spare the child of this person's tyranny, basically. But this child's resolve didn't balk, didn't falter, didn't even blink an eye when that older person stopped talking after they said, what do you have to say for yourself? The child looked up at him and said, my grandpa wants to get closer to Jesus. If getting wet, is, if getting wet once is good, getting wet twice is better. In that moment, this child understood the great power and affirmation of that moment. They saw the joy on their grandfather's life. And out of compassion for them, they did not want it to end. They wanted the power of the baptism to continue. They wanted their grandpa to have a whole dose, a full dose, of the Holy Spirit. Baptism celebrates God's love and God's forgiveness. Jesus commands his followers to go and take this baptism to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are called... We are empowered. We are enabled to share the meaning and the power of our baptism with an enthusiasm that fulfills this command. This, my friends, is what we've been baptized into. To become a part of God's mission, to love the world in the exact same way Jesus loves us. And the people of God said,